switches and do all kinds of things, and make voltages to pin, make noises, do all these things. It's amplified. Now what happens when we have a device like this and we put it in the dark is it goes click, 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 click. Every once in a while, a light particle comes in, a photon. This is a particle in every sense. The experiments have all the right properties as follows. That if you have a very weak light and you have one or two, or just one of them every once in a while, if you put two cells out, and there's just a few of them coming, then it goes on one or the other. They don't go off together. They go off together, you've got too many coming and you can't resolve it. But if it's very weak, the particle is either here or there. And it comes in particle. I don't know how I can much I can emphasize this, especially to young students who have learned its waves. It is particles in every way whenever you can detect it. It's unfortunate for us that we can see the light. I mean, it's unfortunate for us. No, not quite, not quite. <laughs> That we, if we were 10 times more sensitive to light, then in the dark, we would see that what we're seeing is little flashes, little tiny dips, dots of light. The nerve would go off, just like this photomultiplier, in spots. But the human eye is not quite that sensitive and takes five or six of these particles, photons, five or six photons, to make one nerve fiber go off. So, it isn't, so we cannot detect with the eye light quite low enough to notice the fact that it comes in the form of raindrops. All right? Got that. They're particles, right? And you can detect them with an instrument. You can count them, so and so many per second. Bright light, more per second. Dim light, less per second. OK? Now we start to describe the properties of light a little further. Next property I want to talk about is reflection uh, from a glass surface or a water surface. I believe everybody knows that you can see the sun, or the moon, let's say, in the sea as it settles, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Reflections are a happy thing in art pictures. The moon's light reflected from the water. You have a, a window. Uh, when you look through a window, you, there must be millions of examples. Right back there, there is one. You look at a window, you can see through it, but also some reflection. Now, already there's a problem. Because the light that's reflected is not as intense as the light that's shining. Some of the light goes through the window, say, or through the water down in. Only some of the light comes back. If the light is headed for water, for example, straight down, only about 2% reflects. What does that mean, only 2% reflects? That means that if we had a photon counter here, let's say, uh, draw the experiment so you know what I'm talking about. It's hard to make a water surface that's vertical. Yes, so we'll make the water surface horizontal. <laughs> and uh, light's coming down, and some of it's reflected, and we put a counter here to see one of those photomultiplier things, and we count the count. And we know how much we should have got, and we find what. How can it be partly reflected? When, I forgot to say when I was talking about the particles, when you have light of a definite color, the energy that the first one knocks out is always the same. Each particle is the same strength. There's not half particles. It's a full photon. What you get is a full photon. But you only, if the light is dimmer, what does that mean? There are fewer of them, right? Simple. So of 100 that come down here, perhaps uh, four. Now, this way and 96 go through. What determines which four? How does it, which one that's coming down of the hundred knows what to come back up? <laughs> All right? So the situation is that the phenomena is probabilistic. It takes odds. It comes down here and uh, has a 4% chance. One out of 25 trials. Huh? I think you know what odds are. If you have, for instance, a die and you want to get a, a one and you roll it, well, it doesn't come out so often, but it comes out. Sometimes, one out of six. And uh, what that means, if you roll die 100 times, let's make it 600 times, a little easier. If you roll a die 600 times, you might get 105 ones, or maybe 92 ones, or something like that, right? You get about 100. And, in this, and if the numbers were bigger, the accuracy and percentage is bigger, not accurate. Though. So if you have billion, uh, six billion, no, not six, because I got 125, 25 billion of these coming down, about a billion will come off, OK? Now, the, let's see if the, the next feature is how can it be probabilistic? Suppose that I had a light so weak that I had only one photon coming every few minutes. 
Will this counter go off or will the one down here go off? One out of 25 times this one goes off, which time? What determines that? Possible theories. Nothing, pure chance. The world is made of chance. <laughs> that would mean that the physicists can't predict the future. It would mean that if you set up an experiment with exact conditions, you cannot predict what happens in the future because you can't predict whether it's going to go up or going to go down. You just got 4% odds. Your whole beautiful structure of science is reduced to computing odds. Nature, instead of being definite, does everything by chance. Not so good. Other possibilities, there are little spots on here. And all has to, the photon has to hit a spot on the surface. And Newton had several things you'll find out later when I give you more phenomena how these are various explanations, which way it's going to go, and why the spot one doesn't work. But I'll give an argument that Newton made about that. He said it can't be that. Because, he said, you can polish flare. It's wonderful. I love to read these old guys. You know, they, they knew you could polish glass, but they had the intelligence to deduce from the fact that you can polish glass that there's no spots on it. Like, why? What's polishing? See, he polished it. He carved his own lenses. He ground his own lenses. So he knew what it was doing. He takes a coarse grain sand like stuff for, what do they call it? For the, the polishing powder, I mean, the grinding powder, and that shapes it. it cuts, but it cuts fairly obvious grooves. And you take a finer one with finer particles and you cut the grooves of finer and you make the grooves finer and finer and finer. And after they're fine enough, suddenly it's smooth and the light comes right through. When it's coarse, it's bounced around. And so he concluded that light cannot see the grooves. That when I polish it, it's not that it's smooth, it's, it's still bumpy, but on a small scale. Whereas when I dump the big grains, it's on a big scale. It can't be any different. When I polish with the small grains, it's just a small scale irregularity. But somehow, light doesn't see anything on a small scale. Correct. All experiments have shown that this is absolutely not the right explanation. If it was, there'd be all kinds of ways of testing that. I told you we can measure down to 10 to the minus 15 centimeters and so forth. And that what would happen would be you'd be able to find some area to focus very carefully the light so that the two, that the reflection coefficient would be higher than 1 in 25 because you happen to be near the place where there was a spot. Can't do it. No matter what you do, it's 1 in 25. Other possibility, the light that's coming down here, the photons are doing, uh, well, uh, like football. And they spin. And depending upon whether they hit with the nose point or with the flat point, depends on whether they bounce back. In other words, something inside the photon is determining which way it goes. Again, no. Because you can, if that were the case, the light that went through would be all of a certain kind of football. And if you try the reflection again, you'd expect a different number than 4% because of the fact that they're all lined up and you can't line light up. You can't fiddle around up here by any kind of filtering that'll change that percentage. All the light photons are identical if they're the same color, one color. They're all identical and they behave with 4%. Are we therefore reduced to this horror that physics has got reduced not to these wonderful predictions, <laughs> but to probabilities, yes, we have. That's the situation today. In spite of the fact that philosophers have said it is a necessary requirement for science that uh, setting up an experiment exactly similar will produce results exactly the same the second time. Not at all. One out of 25, it goes up and sometimes it goes down. Unpredictable, completely by chance. All right, I really see you turning off. I can see you say you don't understand me. You can't understand that it could be chance. I don't like it. Tough. <laughs> I don't like it either, but that's the way it is, okay? I don't understand it either. I don't understand it. It must be that nature knows whether it's going to go up or down. No, it does not be that nature knows. We are not to tell nature what she's got to be. That's what we found out. Every time we take a guess as how she's got to be and go and measure, she's clever. She's always got better imagination than we have, and she finds a cleverer way to do it than we have thought of. And in this particular case, the clever way to do it is by probability, by odds. And so the first aspect I have to tell you about then is that light works by probability. All right? By the way, just incidentally, the wave theory.